Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the show. So glad you could join me here today for our second Cabral host call of the weekend, where we are going through our community's questions once again, every Saturday and Sunday uh, for the past five years. Now moving into our sixth year, we are answering thousands and thousands of questions uh, from our community, and I absolutely love these shows. I feel like I'm able to connect with our community at a deeper level by seeing what people are struggling with and what I might be able to help with based on 20 plus years of private practice. So uh, again, these questions are all about wellness, weight loss, anti-aging. Without me doing any additional research, what can I give you as a tip? that may allow you to move forward to reach your goals at a faster pace, a healthy way to do it, and as an alternative from what conventional medicine might be telling you right now. I want to make sure that we understand, too, that I'm not giving medical advice. I am not, you are not under the care of uh, this particular doctor, and I want to let you know that I'm going to do my best for you, We're not treating, we're not diagnosing, we're not curing any disease here on the Cabral concept. We are providing you with the ability to rebalance the underlying root causes which hold people back from living a life and having the health that they want. And that's the truth. So the answers that I needed in order to get well were always there. They were always there. It took me 10 years to find them. Now, my goal is to help you find them a whole lot faster. So that's what I do here. So Let's dive right into our show's questions for the day. Every single Saturday and Sunday, we answer six questions per show. First one today is from Freddie. In general, not looking for specific advice, do you recommend plant-based or vegan diet or supplement with choline and or carnitine? Both tend to be lacking in plant foods, but there are studies that show too much choline or carnitine can lead to the toxic compound TMAO. You always have such a balanced perspective on things, so your thoughts on the subject are much appreciated. All the best, Freddie. Freddie, thanks for the question. Appreciate the vote of confidence. What I can show you, share with you is this. So, for a long time, I was essentially... I don't want to say vegan because I, although I was vegan, I wasn't eating any meat-based foods or anything like that. I wasn't living a vegan lifestyle. And being vegan also means typically you're not, you know, you don't have any leather-based products. Uh, you're not using anything that essentially would be come from an animal. So, but anyway, I was, I was vegan for all intents and purposes. So I wasn't eating any meat, any fish, any eggs, anything like that. Now, what I found was this, because you're asking about carnitine and choline. I was not able to, for my body type, keep the weight on as well. And that's why in Ayurveda, when, when we work with people with weight issues, and you'll see this inside of my fat loss system, we put people on more of a plant-based diet. Why? Because it's more of a catabolic diet. So it actually helps you lose the weight. Now, the problem is this, and that's why it's so great for a kapha body type. You're not able to keep on as much mass. Now, it can be good or bad. Now, can you be a vegan bodybuilder? Of course you can. But there's no vegan bodybuilders that are in Mr. Olympia, at least not yet. Now, do I know that all the competitors in Mr. Olympia use anabolic steroids? Of course. Of course. I get it. But by the very nature, meats and flesh of an animal are more anabolic, right? You're, you're, again, in all natural health, you say, okay, well, like increases like. Like your animal flesh, anabolic, puts on more flesh mass on the body. Um, and again, like there's caveats to that. I know that people are going to say, well, when I go on a high protein vegetable diet, I lose weight. You're correct. You are. Yes, you are correct still. Uh, you're not mixing then any of the carbs or anything with that. But that's a topic for another day's show. So, you, your question was this, do you need choline or carnitine? Now, the, question, the question's a good one. It's, it's much more challenging to get carnitine, especially on a vegan diet. I mean, you just have to make sure you're getting your beans in there and your avocado on like a near daily basis. So you can definitely do it, but it's mainly from fish, 
uh, eggs, meat, et cetera, you're going to get the carnitine, especially like red meat. Again, you know, I'm not a huge proponent of eating red meat all the time, but I wanted to share that with you. So, but the nice thing is this in 2021. Now, again, if you're listening to this in 2025, it's going to be the same. It's going to be even easier in 2025 and 2030. So if you're listening to this in 2040, same thing is that you can easily get it through nutritional supplementation if you want. We don't do a lot of carnitine supplementation in my practice. However, if people ask me like, hey, would you mind if I used one or two grams of um, L-carnitine a day to try to put on a little bit more muscle mass because I'm on a plant-based diet? I would say, no problem. It'll help with your mitochondria, help with muscle mass. I don't have an issue with that, right? When we start to get too high, then I have an issue with carnitine for sure because of the same issues that you brought up. However, the toxic compound TAMAO oftentimes is coming from cooked meat, um, which could be a little bit different from uh, carnitine. So, and then choline. Choline's an easy one. I mean, you could just take the activated uh, B-complex. You could take our daily nutritional support. You could take a daily activated multi, and you'll get enough choline. So that one I'm not as worried about. Freddie, hopefully that answered your question. Tommy's up next. If someone is low on elastase in a stool test, what should do the person be doing? What should the person be doing to improve it? Unsure if digestion problems is from low pancreatic enzymes or SIBO related. That's a good question as well. So if you've run our bacteria and parasite stool test, you'll notice on the third page very top one under digestion and absorption, it says elastase. Now, elastase is going to go along with, though, other factors for digestion. I just want you to keep that in mind. So if elastase is off, you're often going to find other absorption markers off. Now, if you just look at elastase, which I never would, but let's say you just look at elastase, you might say, okay, there's an issue with pancreatic enzymes, not enough pancreatic enzymes. What might be going on with the pancreas? Well, could be some type of inflammatory-based issue. And then I would say, well, what does this person's blood sugar look like? What does this person's overall digestion look like? What does this person's insulin sensitivity look like? So that's why, you know, there's no one-all, be-all supplement. There's no one-all, be-all food. There's no one-all, be-all lab test. You want to be able to take in large amounts of data, and your health coach, health practitioner is going to be able to help you with that. So in this particular scenario, you, you very well may be correct that there is an issue related to the gut as well. And you're saying SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it very likely could play a role in this particular condition. So I would say, Tommy, definitely look into that. Um, if you see chronically low uh, elastase, then you do want to make sure though, you're checking in with your MD PCP about this because it could be an issue with that pancreas. And so I'd want to make sure that you get that looked at for sure. Okay. Because the labs that we run are not diagnostic. They help you to find the underlying root cause imbalances. Bettine is up next. Dear Dr. Stephen Cabral, as always, thank you for all the work that you do and for sharing all of your knowledge. My husband is Italian and he has something called anemia Mediterranean. I understand that it is not exactly beta thalassemia, nor is it alpha thalassemia. Have you heard of anemia Mediterranean before? And is there anything you suggest for people with this? Anything for him to be careful of or make sure not to do? I have tried searching through your podcast podcasts, but only two podcasts on thalassemia, but nothing on anemia Mediterranean, or, or as you put it, anemia Mediterranea. I wish you all the best, Bettina. Bettina, I wish you all the best as well. So yeah, I have a fair amount of experience with uh, thalassemia because I've seen it quite a bit in my practice uh, and some members of uh, extended family as well. So for People that don't know what thalassemia is, it's not uncommon. And really, you're looking at a form of anemia. The body is not producing enough red blood cells, or there is an autoimmune issue, which is destroying your red blood cells, some of your red blood cells. But essentially, there's not enough oxygen being pumped through the body with these red blood cells. That's, that's the simplistic version, but it's enough. Like That works. So first things first. Um, there's definitely an inherited genetic component to this. There can be. There can be a bone marrow issue. There can be a spleen issue. So you want to rule those out. Now, you also want to look at ferritin as well as total iron binding capacity. Most people just look at total iron binding capacity. And they, they, doctors don't understand that 
your total iron binding capacity can look good and it can actually be on the higher side. So you're like, okay, everything's good. But if you don't run ferritin, you don't know if iron levels are solid or not. And if you have ferritin below a 50, really, you're not, you're not getting enough iron in. And so you want to look at that. I mean, especially if you're not even producing enough red blood cells, then you want to look at your B12, your folate, your B6, folate, by the way, is B9. You want to look at copper and you want to look at uh, magnesium and vitamin C. Okay, so that's what's going to build up the oxygen in the blood. You could say zinc is in there as well, and I would agree with you. Okay, so that's for oxygenating the red blood cells, and of course, iron if you're low on iron, but men shouldn't supplement with iron, neither should postmenopausal women if their iron levels are healthy. I mean, meaning like you can have a little bit of iron like in our daily nutritional support or daily activated multi, but you don't go and take massive amounts of iron, that's for sure. So and by the way, you get iron from food on a daily basis, like pumpkin seeds and uh, meat and things like that, uh, you know, every day. So don't, don't worry about getting some iron in. You just don't want to overdo it. Okay, so let's get back to it. Um, yes, anemia Mediterranean is actually named after, I believe, don't quote me here, but I believe he won the George Whipple, Dr. George Whipple won the Nobel Prize for thalassemia. And if, you, if I'm not incorrect, thalassemia actually comes from like the Greek word for sea, like ocean of the blood, blood of the ocean, ocean, like something like that. And basically, like there's not enough red blood cells. <laughs> that's really what we're looking at. And so the, the difference is with beta thalassemia is that's much more of a severe condition. Oftentimes blood transfusions are needed. Um, that's going to be more of a congenital based issue. And, um, uh, you know, your husband doesn't have that. So it's not as much to worry about. So thalassemia can absolutely be managed. And oftentimes with good quality diet, proper exercise, uh, maintaining overall health. So and that was a lot. I don't know if that was helpful. I hope it was, Bettina. Thank you. All right, Scott's up next. Hi, Dr. Ball. Thanks for all the information you supply in the work you and your team do. I came across your man fuel diet. Is this something you would still recommend or would you make any adjustments to this form when it was first created? Thanks. Okay, first of all, all questions today are listed at stephencabral.com forward slash 1808. So if you want to read along with that, you can. That is a blast from the past, Scott. I did not even know that that was on my website. That is from like 2004. I got my, I basically created my website in 2000 and I want to say like 2003. Um, I was, I was early to the game. I was very fortunate, very grateful. Why I ever thought to start a website back in 2003, 2004, I have no idea. But I'm very grateful that um, I did that. And this is a diet that's a very anabolic diet. It's not for men. It's just it's for women as well. But back then, I was working specifically uh, working with a lot of men um, looking to, uh, they were athletes, looking to transform their bodies, et cetera, et cetera. It is a very anabolic diet, very anabolic diet. By the way, by the time anyone has goes to the show, that page will now be down because um, there are things like whey protein throughout the day, cottage cheese. Um, like none of it's really bad. It's not, it's a very anabolic diet. It's six meals during the day. It's not the best for health. Now, will it work in terms of putting on muscle mass? The answer is yes. It, there's creatine in there. There's all sorts of different things. Um, so if you want a cleaner version of that, um, I have one inside of a man's guide to muscle and strength, which by the way is for women as well. Uh, but you know, in general, yeah, for sure. I still stand by it. I really do. A couple changes in there, of course, since 2004. Uh, I wouldn't recommend, um, you know, a few of those few of those items in there, like that much dairy for sure. But again, dairy's anabolic. Like, so if your goal is to put on muscle, dairy will certainly be helpful. Okay. Haley's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. First of all, thank you so much for all of your knowledge and willingness to help others. You've taught me a lot, and because of you, I no longer struggle with asthma, allergies, and I've reversed my diagnosed PCOS. Wow, that's amazing, Haley. And that's, I mean, this is one of the pros um, and cons of working with people digitally and doing the podcast every day. I try to do my best to give you exactly what I know works, but I never get to meet any of you. And that's, that's the hard thing for me is because as a practitioner, I saw people face to face for, uh, more than 20 years. Um, and now I do it virtually and digitally. And, and I love it because I'm able to reach more people. But I mean, these success stories are, are what I live for. Like I love seeing these things. So anyway, I, I appreciate you. 
So Haley says, my life changed because of your book, um, only for the better. My question is, could it be possible that a food that is antiviral, antibacterial, or very detoxifying can cause an inflammatory response to show up on the IgG food sensitivity test? For example, a food that is causing a release of toxins via die-off. My second question is, can you explain why our food sensitivities can change and how often most people should rerun a food sensitivity test? Once again, thank you, Haley. Okay, let's tackle these two questions. The first one is this. It was, can it be possible that a food that is antiviral and antibacterial or detoxifying cause an inflammatory response to show up in a food sensitivity test? The answer is, I don't believe so. So like, let's think of one. An anti-inflammatory food would be like broccoli. Would that then show something on a food sensitivity test? I don't see how that would be possible. So I want to, um, I can, you can go and you can just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast and type in food sensitivity and um, you'll be able to find shows on that. I've done, I've taken people through the exact lab of what it looks like. But what the lab does is it basically looks at a 24 hour to 72 hour latent reaction to foods. That means foods that you don't get a stomach ache from, you don't get a skin rash right away from, you don't get a headache or brain fog or hives from. You know, the reactions happen a day or up to three days later. But it's based on the protein of a food um, and your white blood cells, in this case, the immunoglobulin Gs, going after this particular protein strand. And that includes vegetables as well, because there's protein in vegetables. There's amino, I should say, an amino acid structure of vegetables. So would broccoli show up? No. Would like, again, parsley show up? Most likely not. Is it possible? Yes. But um, I've run thousands and thousands of these labs and I don't, I don't see those show up. So I think I might be misunderstanding the question, but no, I don't believe that that's the case. I, I don't believe it. Um, now, why should people rerun the test and how does it get better? Well, it's a great question. I go over this inside of the integrative health practitioner um, level two certification, but you want to anything... Oh, well, here's the, let me see if I can find this for you. Cause I would love for you to just be able to look at the lab test and I'm going to see if I can look real quick. Just give me a few seconds. Cause I'd love for everyone to be able to hear this and then you can kind of take yourself through it. All right. How to read your own. There it is. All right. Episode 1684. If you go to stephencabral.com forward slash 1684, it's all there, but I'm going to give you a quick synopsis. There's a, a darker green section. If you're, you're represented by a black line, that's the sensitivity. The shorter the black line, the less of a sensitivity. There are caveats to this, but I'm going to give you the basis of it. So uh, anything inside the dark green, you're good to go. If it approaches the light green or if it's in the light green, it's a mild food sensitivity. It means that you want to remove it typically for six weeks. If it is in that next uh, yellowish uh, orangey section, then you are going to remove that for 12 weeks. And if it's in the last section, you're going to remove it for six months because those are much more severe food sensitivities. These are not allergies. These are not anaphylactic in nature. These are sensitivities. So here's the thing though. If you give your immune system enough time to not see these amino acid strands from these particular foods and you work on any digestive issues like candida overgrowth, <clears throat> excuse me, SIBO, H. pylori or parasites, um, then, uh, and you seal up that wall with something like the CBO finisher, well, then your immune system isn't seeing these amino acid strands. And if it's not seeing it for a certain period of time, then the memory cells from those immunoglobulins could begin to quiet down and not go after them in the future. And we see this all the time. Like the best example a lot of times is eggs, um, but we see it all the time. So basically, you want to wait... Uh, an appropriate amount of time, which is typically 16 weeks between eliminating the food and then rerunning that lab test? It's a good question. All right. One more question for the day, because I don't think we got our six yet. One, two, three, four, five. Good. Here's our sixth. Darren's up next. Good day, Dr. Brawl. Even though I mostly download and listen to your podcast while I'm driving, I commend you on the YouTube initiative. By the time you read this, It'll be into the new year, so best wishes to you, your family, and staff. My question has to do with Brazil nuts. Is it true that if you eat more than three or so per day, you're highly susceptible to selenium poisoning? I enjoy them, but I've never seen any warning on any package. On that note, are there other nut seeds, herbs, or supplements that you can think of off the top of your head where we should be wary of the upper daily limit, like those we may use daily? 
prosper. Darren, thanks for the question. It's a great question. I've just never been asked before, but I do mention it um, inside of, like, for example, my thyroid health result health results accelerator, um, things like that. So, all right, Brazil nuts, essentially the best food to get more selenium in your body. But Darren is correct. And, and there's no warning on it, but there's no warnings on a lot of foods, right? So for example, let's say that um, you ate a lot of liver and you already had high iron. Well, that would be very bad for your body. So yeah, I mean, overdoing any food can actually be a negative. Now, you want to think about Brazil nuts. They're pretty big. I mean, they're, they're about the size of your thumb. And eating three of those a day is, is actually, that's a lot. That's very filling. So I would say, yes, I really don't say ever go over two. I say one to two Brazil nuts a day for people that need to boost selenium, such as some people with lower levels of iodine, uh, lower levels of uh, thyroid, not iodine. Um, iodine would be more like seaweed snacks or uh, algae, things like that. So Okay, so yes, um, you're looking at about 80 to 100 micrograms of selenium per Brazil nut, I believe, and you really don't want to go over about 200 to 300 micrograms per day. So if you're taking selenium supplementation and you're taking Brazil nuts, you very likely could overdo it. Um, I can't give you all of the different factors, but if you start to feel like you have like garlicky smelling breath, uh, but that could also be from SIBO or digestive issues or um, uh, other issues, and you can look up selenium poisoning. Uh, nausea would be a big one. But that, again, that can happen with um, serotonin poisoning. So again, there's a lot of carryover, but here's the thing. One or two Brazil nuts a day, don't overdo it. If you're already taking selenium supplements, you might need to cut that back a little bit as well. Uh, in general, one Brazil nut a day is plenty, and then you can still take some of your selenium supplementation as well in your uh, activated multi, et cetera. Good question, Darren. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate your listens, your downloads, your shares. I hope it's been a great weekend, and I will talk with you tomorrow on our Mindset and Motivation Monday, which is the very best way to start the week. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much for just tuning in. And before you go, I want to share with you right now over at Equidot Life, we are giving away our very popular 20 ounce tumblers. Think of these as the Equal Life Yeti. It is your ability to carry around your hot coffee, your hot tea, and keep it hot for hours at a time. Or put your smoothie in and keep that smoothie cold for hours at a time. Right now, it is completely free on all foundational based nutrition products for all details as to what all of those products are and see if you qualify head on over to equa.life e-q-u-i dot l-i-f-e for your free 20 ounce tumbler so this again is completely free on any qualifying purchase of these daily foundational products. It is absolutely a popular product over at Equalife. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you use it. Put it to good use. Take care.